So uh, like I said, uh, we'll wait for a couple more minutes, but uh, I hope you are all in here for the Europe briefing. Um, so uh, I'd like to get to know you a little bit better because I'm the administrator for the Europe program in SOC. So um, can I get a show of hands of how many of you are in year one? How many in year two? Okay, most of you in year two. Any in year three? No, or one, two, great. And uh, are you all, uh, who here is from CS? CS, okay. Any from IS? Uh, BZA? CEG? Okay, great. Yeah, come in, have a seat. So the briefing will take about 30 minutes and then it's going to be recorded. It'll be on YouTube as well, okay. Um, so you can, if you have friends that didn't uh, manage to make it to the briefing, they'll be able to access the recorded video later on, okay? All right, um, so I think we have enough to start. So uh, my name is Min. I'm one of the undergraduate assistant deans uh, that sits in the undergraduate office. Uh, I teach our machine learning class and previously our information retrieval class. And for those of you who went through Orbital, I was the one who uh, created that module about seven years ago. Um, in any case, uh, we have a bunch of people in SOC concerned with making sure uh, you have an enriching life here. Um, and one of the ways we do that is through Europe. So actually I want to emphasize that the SOC is one of the few universities in Asia that offers such a research program for undergraduate students as a, a codified research program. So it's uh, quite significant. Even when I was an undergraduate myself many years ago, uh, we didn't have uh, this type of program where, where I was at Columbia University in New York. Um, we had to self-source, okay. But uh, in SOC, basically we have a formalized way of doing it. So that's, that's very good. Um, so uh, just to uh, take note of things here, um, if you have friends who are missing or you'd like to watch this again or you want to see the slides yourself, you can access them. The, the URL is right here, bit.ly soc dash Europe dash 1910. So 1910 is this semester and 10 is the term, first term, right, semester one. So uh, later on, when we finish processing this, uh, we'll put it on YouTube as well. Then you can access the YouTube link. Okay, so um, there are, uh, I, we do this video and uh, briefing every semester. So uh, you need to make sure you're paying attention to the right deck. So if you go to YouTube and search for SLC Europe, you'll find the old versions of this uh, because I don't think the indexer will pick it up right away. So make sure you're looking at uh, this deck of slides, which is for, uh, 1920, uh, semester one. Okay. So, uh, like I said, Europe is a really interesting and very useful opportunity for students who are not quite sure that research is quite up their alley, but they're, they're very interested in that. They might be thinking about pursuing, uh, graduate studies. Uh, and, uh, this is a good way to find out whether you're really suited for that type of career path. Okay. The most important thing is like for many of you who came from a uh, secondary JC or, or poly or international baccalaureate, uh, you may or may not have had experience doing research before. So in doing research, there's basically the idea of the scientific uh, hypothesis cycle, the scientific cycle, right? So you have an inquiry, you have to come out first with a problem, okay? And actually that's a really difficult thing is formalizing a problem statement about what you're going to investigate. Then typically there's some other related work that you need to find out about. So you can use Google Scholar, the ACM Digital Library, IEEE Explore, or other places to go find out what scholars all around the world have been doing in that particular area. Uh, sometimes it's a new area, so you have to figure out what, what areas are related. Then uh, optionally and uh, very enriching is attending other research seminars. So on the SOC homepage, if you go to the website, there's a list of upcoming events. Like uh, just this afternoon, about two hours ago, we hosted in my group, a seminar on uh, spoken dialogue understanding from I squared R. And then after that, uh, you, you know, you have some idea of what's going on. Uh, then you want to propose some way to um, make some type of advance in the area. 
to have to work with your supervisor to propose something new, something interesting, and hopefully make uh, either a revolutionary idea or in many cases for Europe, because it's your first try, will give you a more incremental research project, right? Something just to get your feet wet, to um, uh, get your idea of how research is done, okay? So when you do this, you do some uh, proposal, you have to implement a solution or prove a solution if you're doing theory projects and then uh, often you need to evaluate and then the last part is actually the most important part which is to document it and present present it okay and a lot of students underestimate this part this is actually very crucial without without this uh type of presentation part uh you don't get good marks for your year right so that's the most critical part is being able to document and to present your work well okay so um, Europe has changed a lot this coming semester. So you may have seniors who have done Europe or FYP, and actually all of our project modules in SOC are changing. You are guys are actually the first students to hear about this, okay? And this is because, as you know, uh, SOC has grown in popularity in terms of the degrees becoming more um, you know, important as well as uh, more students interested in doing this work. And uh, because of that, we've had to make significant changes to accommodate the size of the cohort and the impending uh, size of Europe and FYPs that we are going to encounter in the future, okay? So uh, previously, if you uh, knew about Europe from other people, there's an option to do a one semester Europe. So if you're really not sure, you only want to invest one semester to do research, uh, there was a capability of doing that for Europe. Now we recommend people to do uh, this, uh, independent project module okay that is a separate module which i can talk to you offline about which basically only has a single supervisor who is the primary evaluator for your project okay in europe typically we have your advisor give you marks but we also have an external examiner somebody else in the faculty who's judging the quality of your work and it's uh, basically serving as a sanity check okay so students during Europe are now, uh, and it used to be the case anyways, most of uh, Europe students do it for a full year. So two consecutive semesters. So for example, if you sign on this coming semester, you'd be starting in January 2020 and then finishing in November 2020. Okay, so the prerequisites are, are really simple. Basically, we want to make sure that you're having a good successful time in SOC, that courses are not significantly bothering you. Okay, that's the rationale for these two prerequisites. Okay, so we get lots of questions like, uh, for example, I was just asked this too, uh, can I do Europe without having completed 60 MCs? And the answer is no, because we typically want to see that you've established enough track record in the SOC and that your CAP is not in danger. What we worry about first year students is that, you know, because things, uh, are, are quite variable, you can issue a lot of mods and things like that, that actually Europe becomes a liability to you. Okay, we want to make sure that you have your foundations really solid, do 10, 10, 10, 10 S really well, you know, uh, conquer that and make it uh, a very easy course for you. And then because you've done well in your other courses, foundational courses, then, you know, why don't we do some enrichment? Why don't we do Europe, okay? What we don't want is like, say you take too much on your plate and then Europe becomes a liability uh, because uh, Europe doesn't have strict deadlines like homework assignments and tests, then typically Europe students push the Europe off, okay? And they start to panic in second sem. They say, oh God, you know, I've only got uh, two months left. I haven't really done anything on my project. I'm still trying to review the background. I don't even have a problem statement, okay? And then it becomes a liability. That's not a good thing, okay? So we want to make sure these two prerequisites over here, you know, the 60 MCs and the minimum CAP of 3.8, it's just to reassure us that you're on the level, okay? Now, if you have extenuating circumstances, like, oh, I have an Olympiad, or I've done previous research in competing in my H3 or something like that, then you can let us know. We do make exceptions, but again, the, the rhyme and reason for this rule is to make sure that SOC's coursework is not posing a problem to you, okay? So that's why I, I have to check these uh, uh, applications that uh, you will submit. Okay, so how do I go forward? Yeah, okay, so uh, how it works is really simple. Um, basically, in the two semesters, you have continuous assessment, which is your first semester. So uh, you have a continuous assessment 
uh, report that's due at the end of uh, reading week and week 12. Okay, so you have a submission report that you have to turn in. It's, uh, there's guidelines for it. It's not very long. It's just to uh, formally report to your supervisor how you're doing. Hopefully you interact with your supervisor on a regular basis, maybe every two weeks or every month or so. Okay, and then you prepare that report in week 12 and you present it to your uh, supervisor optionally uh, and your main evaluator. So there will be an evaluator assigned to you in the first semester. They're just going to double check that you're on schedule, that you're, you're doing things according to plan. And that will happen during reading week, okay? Then in the second semester, uh, basically that's the bulk of your project. You will have your final assessment, uh, which is uh, very similar to your FYP presentation that you would do for final year project. There's a, a submission report uh, on week 12, okay? And the presentation during reading week. So it's the same type of schedule. It's just that more of your weightage will be assigned there, okay? And then finally, after the examination is done, right, you get a chance to feedback about how your year up went. Of course, we hope you will do that uh, uh, directly with your supervisor, but uh, formally for our data capture, you have to do it online as well, okay? So there will be a, a feedback form that you have to tell us about how your supervisor went, how the, your defense went, whether the exam, assigned examiner understood your project or whether you had a lot of difficulty with that or not. And then finally, uh, after you have done your FYP, uh, sorry, your Europe report, um, you will submit an e-copy of your final Europe report with any adjustments that you want to make uh, for, for that, okay? Now, let me make it clear. Even though there's a final e-copy of your final report, whatever adjustments you make between here, okay, and here are not graded, okay? That means your examiner and your supervisor only look at the version that you present here uh, that you turn in here and that you present at the oral presentation. So you do a presentation like this one, you have slides, okay, uh, you give a 15 to 30 minute talk about what you've done over the year and then the examiner uh, or your supervisor may ask you questions and then they'll assign a grade to you, okay? So um, if the presenter, uh, if your supervisor or your examiner says it would be great if you could make these changes, you can go ahead and do that, but uh, your grade is not conditional on the changes that you make, okay? Everyone clear about that? Okay, great. So how does it work? Actually, um, in any case, if you had any questions about FYP or Europe, the evaluation scheme is exactly the same now, okay? It used to be different. We are canonicalizing it to make it easier for all of our staff and all of our students to deal with it. So if you have friends concerning FYP, the structure is exactly the same, okay? Again, uh, you turn in the report during reading week. It is assessed during, uh, uh, sorry, you turn in the report during uh, week 12 and it's assessed during reading week, okay? And the evaluation criteria and the amount that's assessed in is also the same, okay? So there'll be 30% of your grade due to your first semester involvement, okay? So your first semester, basically you're thinking about the literature review, trying to figure out the problem that you're interested in doing, okay? And um, understanding how to frame that, reading related work, okay? And at the end of that, uh, semester, you submit a continuous assessment report, which covers that and ideas for how to improve the state of the art in that area. Okay, so 15% uh, will come from your supervisor, 15% will come from your main evaluator, and the criteria that we are going to look at are, are all of these. Okay, so quite a lot of it comes from the understanding of the problem as uh, starting uh, as you're starting to get an idea of how to formalize it. Okay. In the second semester, right before you finish your op, you turn in your uh, final report again, it will be assessed uh, along with your oral presentation for 70% of your grade, okay? And that comes in these two parts, okay? So there'll be parts of it that's concerned about the report itself, and uh, the other parts are jointly uh, graded through both the report and the presentation, okay? So again, it depends on your supervisor, it depends on your examiner, what they want to do, okay? Uh, examiner is not obligated to look at your report, although most of them do, okay? Many of them may just say, okay, I'm going to base it based on your presentation, how well you present your work, okay? So um, that's why having a good practice of your presentation is very crucial, 
because a lot goes riding on that, okay? And again, it's split between your supervisor and your main evaluator, okay? So both of them have an equal say in the final grade that you get, okay? Any questions so far? So the important part here is I think it's good to have a good rapport uh, rapport with your main evaluator because your supervisor, of course, hopefully will be dialoguing with you on a, a continuous basis. But your main evaluator is responsible for a whole half of your grade, right? So who wouldn't want to get that six MCs, uh, four MCs worth of credits on your side? So you should have a dialogue with them by emailing them and checking with them. You know, can I do an interim presentation? Could I get some information about how to present better? Or what are you looking for in my project? How do I get an A for this? Okay, and then check with them what their expectations are for your project. Okay, don't leave it to chance. Eight MCs is a lot of MCs, right? And this is exactly the same type of practice that you can do if you decide to extend your year up into an FYP later on. Many students do that. So what happens is uh, you are registered for this course, CP3209. It's a single course module that will serve you for both semesters. In the first semester, after you finish your first semester, you will get an IP in progress grade for that semester. And that will magically revert to the actual grade you get for both semesters um, at the end. Okay, so you have eight MCs allocated for the whole year. You get a single letter grade for that. Okay, any questions? I'm putting some of you to sleep, or you guys are really tired from uh, having to study for exams, okay? Hey, you're awake, great. All right, so uh, today is the 2nd of October. Uh, we already have application forms open. I have a paper uh, copy of some of these, and you can go to the Europe website. It has been updated with this information, so you can go visit this URL, and I'll show you that in a minute here. Let's see, come off of presentation mode and switch to that. Okay, so uh, if you click on that link, a tiny URL link, you'll arrive here. Okay, so this is the form that we're asking you to fill out now. So you just uh, provide this information, your know, student number, uh, a contact number like a hand phone, tell us which program you're in uh, and the year of study and uh, whether you're a USP student, because if you're a USP student, you can use this to fulfill your independent study module requirements. Okay. Um, and then you can fill out uh, a couple sentences or so about which areas of computing you're interested in. So we have some idea of what uh, you're, you've done already or you're interested in. Okay, and you can tell us a little bit more about uh, information on uh, what other past research you have, if any. Okay, it's typical uh, that people don't fill this out because they don't have any, but if you do, it does help us a little bit to have some information. Okay, uh, we're gonna change this line, but this is basically, the number of MCs that you've taken already coming into this semester, plus the ones which you are enrolled in currently. So say I'm a, a second semester student, let's say I, I started in January, okay? So I took 20 MCs of courses already, and now I'm uh, taking another 20 courses, 20 MCs worth this semester, and let's say I came from Poly, I got another 20 MCs of unrestricted electives or, or, or APC, then I have a total of 60. Okay, so at the end of this semester, when I start my Europe in SEM 2 of uh, AY 1920, I will have satisfied the requirements of uh, having 60 MCs, okay? So this is what this uh, currently obtained means, okay? And then uh, it's not uh, really that important to us, but again, because we want to make sure coursework is not a bother to you, and that even if you're doing Europe, you won't be on academic probation, we need to know your CAP, okay? So I'm just gonna fill this out, um, you know, so that we can get to the next page of the form. Okay, and the second half of the form is basically the project assignment form. So actually you won't be able to fill this out right away and I'll come back to this, okay? This that basically tells us which prof and which project are you going to be doing um, as part of your, your work, okay? So I'll come back to this in a second, all right? So this is the second half of the form. Any questions so far? Okay. 
Okay, so uh, what you do is uh, basically go through this process. You click on the form that I just showed you. Um, then uh, you have to ask your Urop supervisor that you've negotiated with to drop uh, Jia Ying, uh, our administrator who's uh, in charge of Urop, uh, to confirm that they have agreed to take you on as a student, okay? And then uh, Jia Ying will forward the application for me. We'll just uh, make sure you cross your T's and dot your I's in, in terms of your CAP and your course load and uh, the number of modular credits that you've taken, and then you'll be approved. Okay, so uh, this is basically just a sanity check. Okay, it's not to say that if you apply for Europe, there's some like rejection ratio. There isn't. Okay, we let everyone who who applies take it because we think uh, you're great. You're great students. Okay, so actually we don't have a specific deadline which we ask Europe students to apply for, but it is a really good thing to start early. Okay, to have some idea of the project that you want to do. So this is why we ask you try to complete it before things get heavy in terms of exams and reading week and et cetera. So we'd like to give you a, a notional deadline of uh, 8th of November, about a month from now, okay? So with all that in mind, uh, you might be thinking, okay, how do I find projects that are of interest to me? Well, SOC is a really big faculty, actually. It's a big school. We have over 100 professors in computer science, over, uh, no, sorry, about 80 professors in computer science and about another 30 or so in information systems and analytics. So there are people who do all sorts of work in computing. It's just whether uh, you find those uh, people interesting, one, uh, and whether you get along with them well. Because again, supervisor and uh, student fit is a really important component, okay? Uh, so you do want to make sure of that. So the first thing you should do is browse through the project list. Okay, so let's do that. So I'll go ahead and sign in. Hopefully I remember my password. Okay. So if you go to um, the Europe page, there are lots of different uh, projects here. What you should be noting at this time, okay, is the title of the uh, project, okay, and the supervisor, okay? So if you wanted to do like more game development, uh, AI uh, game uh, generation of levels or things like that, um, some of them are, are done by our games professor, Anand Bojan. Um, uh, Chi Yong does some of our database work. Uh, so he's looking at query reverse engineering, uh, cardinality constraints in database systems. Okay, um, so we actually have the world's best database group here in SOC. So if you wanted, if you were ever interested in database and want to be famous, uh, work with the database group. Okay, uh, we have a, a lot of other people doing uh, many different types of work. So uh, Cha Tat Seng uh, is our multimedia professor. He's doing things like uh, looking at uh, image recognition using the phone and then trying to track the amount of food that you consume, calories, and whether um, it's related to diseases, et cetera. So food recommendation, uh, nudging for telling people to eat healthily, et cetera, which is pretty hard to do in NUS, okay? Uh, but you get the idea. Uh, there's a lot of other projects that you can look at here, okay? So why do I say it's important to look at the projects? Because again, you want to locate, okay, a short list, you want a priority queue of about five to 10 professors, okay? Because actually, many times, the exact project you're interested in, you're like, wouldn't it be really cool if I did something like that, won't be listed by the prop, okay? But they're interested in that general area, okay? So that's why it's good to know professors rather than projects, okay? You can still go to the specific project. So if you click on the blue link, um, it'll tell you a little bit about what, what this is about, right? So this says over here, a dental visit for somebody with ASD um, is pretty, challenging so they want to deal with this in, in some other way, okay? So uh, you can take a look at the, the, the information, okay? So uh, for that, okay? So um, the other thing that I'll mention that's very, very, very important is that um, Europe, because it's a small program, it's only dedicated for those of you here who are, you know, basically the top students in SOC, um, we don't get that many proposals from Europe from our professors where we have a lot more projects is in FYP, okay? So uh, you can go to the FYP site too, 
and also look at the proposals there. So there's uh, many, many more projects, okay? So uh, I would suggest that you triangulate between both the FYP and your op proposals. If you find that uh, after scanning both, that you find some projects of interest that are in FYP, go to talk to the professor. Say, I know this, you proposed this as FYP. Does that mean it's more challenging, that it's not doable as a Europe? And most of the time they say no, okay? It's definitely doable as a Europe too, okay? Because basically for most research projects, you don't need a lot of research background for it. Most of the projects, let's say for my, my area, I do um, AI, deep learning, and natural language processing. Actually, our coursework in SOC, the amount of coursework you need to know to do those projects is about one week's worth of lecture because the project is very specific, okay? And when you take a course, basically it's always an introductory course on a certain area. Like we might introduce you to AI, right? But AI is so broad, right? So there's always very specific parts of AI that when you do a research project, you need to know much more about, okay? So this is why even though you might think, okay, I'm only a second year student, I don't have enough knowledge, actually being a third year student or fourth year student doesn't help very much, okay? It is the acumen of investigating a particular, very narrow focused area for enough time that leads you to start to get insights, okay? But that said, sometimes you can get some ideas from other courses, okay? So that can help a lot. Okay, so you can see some here. So Ken Sung is our uh, bio one of our bioinformatics professors. This is myself, so I'm in natural language processing. Um, and then we have uh, Wee Kang, which is doing medical imaging. Okay, so there are lots of different types of projects that you can look at, okay? So let me go back, all right. So uh, basically, uh, you can look through all of those different project listings. Uh, which you can uh, find on the project administration site, but you can also propose your own projects. Some of our faculty are very willing to supervise projects of your own design, okay? So if you have some cool idea, for example, you did Orbital or another type of project module, and you already think, oh, well, uh, you know, I would like to inject some research aspects of that into my project, then, you know, come and talk to the faculty. Some of them actually list in their, uh, FYP listings that they're okay to have a project that's of your own design. They're open-ended for that, open-ended projects, okay? So those are the faculty that you can approach, especially if it overlaps with their expertise. Like I know Anand, who I told you is our games professor, he's actually quite open to students proposing their own game projects. Okay, so for example, he's gotten some students to use an AI to generate levels of the right hardness given the amount of levels they've completed, et cetera, okay? that type of thing, okay? But uh, again, as it says on the slide, the bottom line for all of this, okay, is that you need to make sure that you have the best project and the best mentor, okay? So don't settle with just talking to one professor. Oh, this professor said, okay, I'm gonna be that professor's student, okay? I mean, let's take an example. Like say you're shopping for a new handphone, right? Are you just gonna just go to one vendor or, or, or one model and say, that's the one that's for me? because the salesman recommended it. I mean, a handphone is a fairly significant decision, right? So you're gonna look at a couple different models, all right? It should be the same for any courses, especially that's worth eight MCs, right? So it's in your best interest to shop around, okay? So this is why I told you, try to identify between five to 10 professors, okay? Email them or knock on their door, okay? And then say, you know, sir, ma'am, I'm interested in working with you. I noticed you have this project. Would you be able to uh, talk with me about it? Some of them will be too busy. Sorry, I don't have time this week, maybe next week. Then you might say, you know, well, you know, I don't want a professor who's not able to, to have enough time for me, okay? Uh, but, you know, maybe that is really the area you want to work in, okay? But the, the important part is after you've done enough shopping, so to speak, then you will be able to select with more confidence, right? Because who knows, the next person you talk to might be that one person in SOC who can give you a, a much better leg up on the interest that you have, okay? All right, so uh, you, know, you may not be shopping around for uh, potential spouses or other things, but definitely for research projects and the supervision, this is very important, okay? Getting a good fit is, is really important, okay? because people have different interests. They also have different advising styles. Some professors, because they have a very large army of people, may not supervise you directly. 
they may say, here's my postdoc, we'll see you next year, good luck with the postdoc, okay? Then uh, you, you can assess whether that postdoc is of the right personality that you get along with, okay? All right, so I went over this project site, so you can take a look at uh, uh, some of them. They're just in the slide deck for your reference as well. But again, check, uh, check the project listing, find names or, or Unix IDs of people, go scout them out on the web. Everyone has a website. I mean, this is computer science and uh, information systems for God's sake, right? Um, and then uh, see what type of work that they're doing. Okay. Um, there are some differences between Europe and FYP. I don't think we really need to tell you for this crowd, uh, but we tell this to our faculty so that they understand what the differences are. So you can read it. Basically, we think Europe because it's not a compulsory course and uh, FYP is definitely coming that way too, okay? Uh, that only really strong students who really, really have an acumen for research or are curious enough about it are willing to do Europe. Okay. It's actually pretty hard to do Europe as an undergraduate unless you have enough uh, coursework under your belt. Okay. So um, this, this is why Europe students, even though they're doing less MCs worth of work, actually turn out almost the same amount of work as the FYP student or sometimes even better. Okay. So um, we also try to entice our faculty members to offering Europe because sometimes they think, okay, well, you know, a second year student, maybe not that worthwhile, but you, usually if you like a subject area and you get along with that professor well, you come back and do uh, your FYP with her as well, right? And if you have worked with the same professor for two years and you're doing well, it's quite easy to get a good recommendation letter from her or him and, and go to grad school either in Singapore or obviously overseas as well, okay? So um, um, that's a very big difference. The other big difference, as it says here, is that uh, FYPs can be non-research oriented. So of course, Europe has the R in it, that means research, so you have to do something that's new, unseen, uh, possibly could fail, okay, may not produce good results, but you will have gone through this entire developmental cycle that we call scientific research, okay? The part of coming up with a theory, coming up with a problem, trying to implement it, investigate how other solutions do, uh, evaluating it, uh, writing it up, and communicating it. That's the whole cycle that all scientists, all faculties, all students have to do when they're doing research, okay? So uh, you might be asking, well, you know, that sounds sort of scary. Will I get a bad grade if I don't get a good result? And the answer is no, okay? What we really look for is your capability to do independent research, okay? So if you fail, that's fine, as long as you learn how to fail appropriately, okay? The other uh, big difference is it's a full year project, okay? So you're doing eight MCs, but you're expected to work during the summer, okay? Now, the first question that I get is, excuse me, Min, I, I want to do an internship. I heard it's really good to do an internship. Does that mean I can't do an internship if I do Europe? I mean, that's what's, you know, I'm not so interested then, okay? And the answer is no, you can definitely do an internship. Okay, you need to disclose it to your professor, your proposed supervisor first. Uh, hey, prof, I'm going to do an internship, is that okay with you? And they'll say either, yes, I think that's fine. Just keep on reading papers and getting an idea, implementing things, check in with me every month or so. Or they'll say, no, really, this project requires full-time commitment. I expect you to be working over the summer on it too, okay? And so uh, that's up to them. They're the judge of the project about how much work it requires, and then you have to be open to that. Putting on my other hat, not as a Europe supervisor, not as the Europe administrator, but as a student advisor, I think it is much, much more compelling to do internship for an average student than doing Europe, okay? So if you had a choice and you were deciding to do Europe or internship, I would say definitely go internship, okay? Because it gives you a much broader exposure outside of academia, okay? That said, that's for the average student. Okay, now you all here are probably not average students. You're doing at least better than average because you know, you're talking, uh, hearing about the Europe program. Okay, so those of you here may be interested in graduate school. Okay, uh, if you are, then I would definitely say Europe is a better program for you. Okay, why do I say that? Because typically when you apply for graduate school, especially your doctoral studies, you need letters of recommendation. 
Okay? And letters of recommendation from an internship supervisor don't count for much if you are trying to get into a, a, a advanced studies program. They usually want to see letters of reference from an academic, you know, somebody who's already doing the same work that they're doing. Okay? So for that reason, Europe is much more useful. If you play your cards right and you do Europe with one professor, you do FYP from another, great. You have two distinguished professors writing letters for you. Okay? And that kills off most of the problems that you have for recommendation letters. Okay? So uh, regardless of whether you take Europe or not, if you were ever thinking about doing graduate school, either master's or doctorate, do think now okay, at the stage where you are, where you want to get your letters from. Okay, it doesn't hurt to start early and thinking, okay, well, there's this one course like machine learning. I really am interested in that area. Or, you know, networks is my thing. I really want to do cybersecurity. I really want to do well in those modules. Okay, work towards being able to ask that professor, can I get a letter of recommendation from you? And they'll say, who are you again? I don't know you. Oh, yeah, you're the, the person who I've never seen before, right? Except shows up during the midterm and final, right? That's bad, right? You want them to know you. So, Make sure you interact with them during your courses, okay? All right, um, let's talk about money. So for both FYP and Europe, uh, actually your supervisors can apply funding on your behalf, okay? Now this is not funding for pizza parties and Subway sandwiches, you know, this is uh, funding for things definitely related to your research project. So for example, CEG students, I think there's some CEG students here, if you're doing anything related to Internet of Things and you need to buy a device like a, a set of Raspberry Pis or something like that or a controller or IP cam, okay, your supervisor can uh, buy them on your behalf and then get reimbursed from SOC to the tune of $200 per student. So for example, if there are two different projects or one project that has two students on it, okay, your supervisor can uh, buy up to $400 worth of things and then get them reimbursed from SOC, okay? Now this is on a first come, first serve basis. There is a budget for this. So if you think you might need to buy hardware uh, or, or software or any type of other access, a subscription to some software, then get your uh, supervisor to sign off in it, get it bought, and then get it to be reimbursed, okay? So actually we have quite a lot of success stories uh, for Europe. So here's one. Uh, this is uh, uh, one supervisor in our AI group, uh, Dr. Brian Lowe, who teaches our machine learning course as well. Um, so he had uh, one student who uh, did Europe with him on uh, Gaussian processes. It's uh, one of the more advanced topics in machine learning that we don't usually teach to our uh, undergraduates. Um, and they were doing it for uh, big data, right? Uh, data that's changing or coming in at a, a, a large time step, okay? Um, and then in our uh, media division, uh, Hui Tao leads our NLP group, our natural language processing group. We had a student doing statistical machine translation a la uh, uh, Google Translate. Um, so they did a, a system that uh, outperforms Google Translate at that time uh, for certain languages, okay? Uh, myself, I've had quite a number of Europe students. Uh, I had one Europe student who is also working in natural language processing. He did his undergraduate uh, uh, Europe with me. Then he did lyric alignment for his FYP also with me. Then he went on to Stanford to do his PhD. Then he went to Google DeepMind and now he's a very famous researcher. So um, we have plenty of pathways like that for students. I mean, I'm just one of many professors here and we all have students that have gone through Europe like that, okay? So I think uh, Europe is a really a, a really good program for those of you who want to do uh, graduate studies or who want to uh, investigate whether research is the right pathway for you. Okay, um, there are some small amount of issues. I won't talk about these. These are on the slides just so that uh, you can have reference to them. Um, but uh, I'll be happy to take your questions uh, about the program. So um, I'll break here. Okay, thanks for coming. So uh, if you want a hard copy form for this, uh, you're welcome to come. Uh, again, everything is in the URLs that we showed you already. This just tells you the specific application process. Okay, so it's um, back here. Okay, this slide is basically on this sheet of paper. All right, so if, you, if you'd like a copy, you can come up and uh, take one.
So I, I will stick around until almost four o'clock. So if you have questions about particular areas, uh, let me know. Okay. That's all. Thank you for coming.